We're near the mouth of the river here, probably about a mile and a half from the foil. And this is where the trout and salmon congregate, especially in low water. This is where the anglers congregate as well. We get all kinds of anglers along this stretch of river bank. It's a place called Campsie. It's the most populated stretch of the river Fahan. But the most marvelous thing about angling, and we find it especially here, is that uh, Everybody enjoys it. Cuts across all ages and all creeds and classes. We get the fellow who's unemployed and has very little else to do. We get the man who maybe is a bit out of sorts and just wants to come here and sit down and do a bit of angling. We get the highly trained professionals. We get all sorts of people coming along this bank of the river. Plenty of fishes here too. The trout, the salmon, the mullet, the roach, the pike. A good variety of fishes. But the problem at the moment, and one of the things that the anglers have difficulty understanding is how come there are so many fish here and we're not catching them? There are, there are many different theories about this and uh, it would be no bad idea to hear some of those theories, I would think. Yeah, well, see, oxygen in the water, I think once the oxygen starts to be taken out with it, the well that we've been having. So the algae all along. The algae was breaking away from the bottom and dropping to the top. The algae is that scummy stuff. The scum. The but then the one you see. 30, 30, 30 yesterday, right oh. enough, and I think that there were more life in it, and it's a bit of a clear day today. I, I have a shrewd suspicion that, that uh, I may be wrong, of course, and I stand to be corrected on this. It must fish light. I believe it's the state of the water. I believe it's the state of the water at the moment. That, uh, well, if you go back as far as what? The 1st of April. Here, Manas, now that that looks a big soft thing to me. Well, I would say that would be a sort of a what do you call a slab worm? The other night, in the wet night, I was at the garden at one o'clock in the morning with a good torch, and the garden was full of those here, the boys here. But the, they were bigger, some of them were bigger than that there, but that there would do a trout. But the ones I was getting would have been more or less for a flood. And a, that would, they would have been heavier than that. They would have, they would be uh, great for salmon, you know, and a good flood. But these wee small ones here, these blackies. Blackheads, these small ones here are great for trout. You couldn't uh -huh. beat them for trout. And these we call these here sort of a brambly worm. But yes. at night, you want to be out in the garden at night with a lamp, it's perfect to see the worm when you reach for them, they it disappear. You bring them up with a lamp? No, they're, they're, they're up with a lamp and they're creeping along the ground. And you put the light on them and you reach for them, they got there. And if you just touch the ground at all, at least be able to go out all the way. Some it's people will throw dishwater in the ground. Oh, no, bring good them up. At all. no good at all. No good. No, I don't touch do that. I wouldn't touch it at all. It's no good for worms, it destroys them. Destroys the worm. Uh, a lot of boys use an electric poker, a big electric spanner or something, and they leave it into the ground and uh, turn on the electric, and you see them come creeping up through the ground with the electric. But uh, I find that the best worms the whole lot are the ones you get at night with a lamp. Good, and they're short, there's a shortage of these things there this is. year. There is, terrible, terrible, terrible shortage of worms a year. Uh, there's a man selling them now beside where I live at £3.100. Three pound a hundred. Yes, worms. that's what he's getting for them. Three pound a hundred. Well, I mean, is he able to sell them? He is able. To, he's able to sell them. Surely they're at the door every night looking for them. And there's a farmer up the road too. And he's selling them too at three pound a hundred. And there's a boy in Carlisle Road selling them at I don't know. I think at two fifty. He's selling. How's that? Well, I mean, I've never heard the likes of that before. Well, no, that's true. You know. I never, think these uh, two men here can verify that. And this is simply because uh, of the the very dry ground. Dry well, yes, right. spell. 
Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a yes. dry spell we're on it. Okay, well then, we better not expose these things too long to the sun. Because no, because they the dry them up. up. And dries them up, it and does, they're, they're, they're short, there's, there's a big enough shortage of them, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to put them back into <laughs> your... Uh, to your pocket. That's the right swine. Who owns these worms anyway? Do we really. split them up? Or? Um, no, give them to him because he might be looking for them before night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, well, I hope right. you have a bit of luck with them. Not well, well, I hope so. I hope so, in a way. Some anglers keep jam jars full of worms in their, in their fishing bags. I keep a box of flies. There are a whole lot of people like me. I don't like putting a worm on a hook. I like fly fishing. Maybe it's because they're very attractive things. But they're deadly as well. They, they carry beautiful names. The Harry Mary, the Bloody William, Curry Shrimp, the Black Panel. Lots of names most often called after their inventors. Now this box of flies I have here would contain mostly standard creations such as the Peter Ross or the Black Panel but I would also make modifications of those for myself. If I go out to the river and I find a certain fly that I tie kills a fish or a trout then I'll go back out uh, I'll go back home and I'll tie a half a dozen of those flies and, and keep trying them and uh, that's one of the beauties of fly fishing and tying your own flies. It's a very important, in fact, part of angling. And in the angler's bag you'll also find this kind of thing. This is a homemade one. It's called a priest. And it's called a priest because it administers the last rites when that trout or that salmon finds itself on the bank. That's a trout. It's only a wee brown trout. And I'm not going to do him any harm. We'll just get him in. The problem with tiny trout is that they their body temperature is about half my body temperature. So I'm not going to handle them because I'll probably scald them. And I don't want to leave them hanging in the water too long either because uh, we'll only asphyxiate them, he'll only, he'll only die. So I'm going to bring him in. Here we are. I see fellas, you know, and they lift these fish out of the, out of the river. And then they think they're doing them a good turn putting them back. They'd be better taking them home to the cat rather than handling them because they only die. Then I suppose the otter or something like that will get them. So, <coughs> good lad. I've got to. Uh, take your time. Just relax. I'm not going to do you any harm. He's caught in the lip. So we'll get him off under the water.
I don't like catching those wee brownies. But whenever you're out after the bigger trout and salmon, after the sea trout, that's, that's the chance you take. But we didn't do him any harm. Here would be cut in July now. Now the shell is cut down in the beginning of May. So that doesn't suit the corn crake at all. It doesn't suit the corn That's crake. That's deprived the corn crake of its habitat. Yes, I've seen the corn crake wend its way through the long grass often. It seemed to run and zigzag yeah. through the grass. You don't often see them flying. They're a very Haven't. secretive bird. They must be. I, uh, I've seen the corn crake and the grass run and seem to zigzag and uh, when it was running, it was a brown bird. That's big, right. Big brown Total bird. brown bird. Aye. But uh, it makes up for not seeing it by its voice, doesn't it? Oh, I like the corn creek and the fading twilight. Yes. Yes. Well... And the fading twilight of a western sky. <laughs> I, would tend to, I would tend to agree with you now, Robert, that you know, even along the Fahan Valley, a whole lot of other places as well, yes. lots of machinery. Man seems to have taken over, hasn't he? Uh, he's taken over and the civil engineer came into being with his bulldozers and he has changed the face of the earth, the civil engineer. <laughs> for the better or the worse? Oh, I think it's, it would be for the worse. He seems to have altered everything with which he has come in contact with. Well, what about the kind of... Um, what about the general atmospheric state, the colour of the grass, the oh. the state of the air, the state of the water, all of those kinds of things? Since well, since the, the leaves of the trees are still green yet. Thomas I. Alva Edison, a great American inventor, who had 1,500 inventions to his credit when he died, he explained why the leaves of the trees and the grass in the field, why they were green and why they were no other colour. And did, did you pick up what he was telling? Oh, yes. Thomas Alva Edison, a great American inventor, had 1,500 inventions to his credit when he died. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, well, why did he explain that the grass was green? Well, he was a great physicist. Edison had a mighty brain. His brain was reckoned to be five pounds in weight, a pound and a half heavier than average man's brain. Good heavens. The heavier the brain, the more intelligence. <laughs> the problem with boys like Edison is, of course, that they they create things that aren't always, uh, you know, they, they cut across, they're a bit too pacey for the way nature operates, aren't well, they? Well, it was, Edison was once asked, did he discredit the idea of a supreme being, and he knew what his answer was. said, he, no man can find himself close enough to nature without being convinced that behind it all, there is a master mind with a supreme intellect which operates through unchangeable laws. And th that was his answer. Incredible. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> but people don't seem to have paid much heed. I mean, I mean, to this great design or whatnot, people have come along and gone ahead with doing things their own way. Yes. And Edison was scarcely 11 months at school. No yeah. university or nothing. This salmon here is a fahan fish. It went out to the Atlantic probably about a year and a half ago. It's what we call a grills or a maiden fish. It's a member of the salmon family, but it's what we would call a virgin salmon. It's coming up the river for the first time after maybe a year and two months out at sea. But how the fish actually moves through the water is that along the back of the fish, it's a very muscular animal, we have 
blocks of muscle tissue running down each side of the spine of this fish. The actual movement of the fish happens at, the, at its head and then you get a shudder moving along those blocks in a kind of a zigzag fashion. That shudder then approaches the tail wrist and the tail responds and, the, and creates some pulsion and the fish moves forward. And how it moves relies to some great extent on the lateral line. It will know what line to follow itself in the water because the pressure of the water is striking these cells along the lateral line. So the block of muscles allow the fish to twist and move and turn. The lateral line allows the fish to find the kind of access route or the kind of route it wants to follow. The marvelous tail will allow it forward like a propeller. And inside the fish itself there is a thing called an air bladder and that air bladder responds to levels and pressures and allows the fish to lift itself high in the water or to stay low in the water to maximize the amount of oxygen it gets to protect itself from debris and other things that might cause it injury coming downstream. So altogether this tiny fish, a gross six pound fish, went out from the spawning beds of this river a year and a half ago and come back as this magnificent animal. <laughs> Got one? Yeah. Oh, good for you. It's a sea trout. Yeah. Go and hold that a minute till we get a look at this trout. That's a good trout. Now, what, what width would that be? Point and a half or so. Oh, it's a good trout. And it's a wee hand trout. That's good. What'd you get it on? A bit. Open the land, is it? On the worm. Just still bait fishing. Did I give you a good fight? Aye. You don't seem too, too excited about it. You must be pleased, Dave. <laughs> what about these other fellas? I think he's in shock now. You're in shock? Well, what you have to do is you have to put it in. You have it in a net, but you need to wrap it in grass or something in case it dries open you. You know? So, we'll stick it back in the net. Is that your first throw of the season? Yeah. Good for you. Well done. This is a beautiful big redwood down in deep in the middle of this wood. It reaches higher than any of the other trees in this wood. It's probably 250 feet tall. It's certainly 300 years old. And every time I come into this clearing, I can smell it because of this great thick bark, there's a resin. Now, the thing that always strikes me about the redwood is it's cleared this, this place for itself. It won't allow anything else to grow here. 
because it takes an awful lot of mast and an awful lot of mulch to keep a big tree like this alive. It compensates in other ways. On this side of the tree here we can see where it's layered itself. It's just shot out a part of itself, just leant forward, planted itself into the ground to give rise to this another very, very respectable tree. And up in these branches, if we look hard enough we'll find the squirrel and different kinds of birds. For me this is a beautiful place, this clearing in the middle of this woods, very quiet, very, very peaceful. It's, it's the kind of place you'd like to bring your girlfriend. Another wee shower. It's good to see them freshen the whole place up and get the trout moving. It's really trout I'm after, you know. I'm not really after salmon. It's a wee trout rod I'm fishing. There's nothing, for me, there's nothing better than a, than a good two pound seed trout. Or for that matter, a pound brownie. I couldn't care, I never caught a salmon. I think I respect them far too much. Well, I don't measure the pleasure I get in fishing and the actual number of fish I catch. It's, uh, it's hard to explain, but I don't actually fish for fish. I fish for the pleasure of fishing. Now it's hard to get that maybe across, but maybe some people wouldn't understand that. You know one thing that struck me, sir. Angling has become a very serious kind of thing. I mean, it used to be an enjoyable and, That's right. and you know, it's, it's become very serious. Everybody's very, very determined to catch fish and not enjoy the, it's take it easy. Angling's supposed to be t about taking it easy. And well, I, I have a terrible thought about this and I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong. But I think it's a, a sort of a, a carryover from the put and take fisheries of England and everybody reads magazines nowadays and everybody's out to get their limit bag in these reservoirs. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I don't come out here for, for nothing if I can catch a trout. Of course. But if I don't catch a trout, it's not the end of the world. The fish are moving now. Trout and salmon are running. It's become very lively. The river's very lively. The rain's bringing down flood water. And there's more to come. It's a bit grumbly for the fly. But I'm going to have a go at it anyway. 